world tomorrow. Herbert W. Armstrong brings you the plain truth about today's world news and the prophecies of the world tomorrow. It's going to end this civilization. Just how near are we to the nuclear World War III right now? Are we in the last days? I've mentioned a book that several times recently. Let me mention it once again. Are we in the last days now? That's a booklet. Are we in the last days? Write in for your copy. I probably will forget to announce that at the close of this program, but you write in for it if you don't already have it. Just how near we are to the nuclear World War III? Well, only Bible prophecies can tell you that. Bible prophecies tell you what is going to happen in general from here on out. Not the details, but in general. And we can know a great deal about it. The book of Revelation is the chief book of prophecy in the New Testament. So I would like to come now to the 17th chapter of Revelation. And that is one that tells about the final battle and the second coming of Christ. Revelation 13, or Revelation 17, I mean. And uh, first I'll just read two or three verses here. Verse 3. And incidentally, John, who wrote the Revelation, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him. He sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And John wrote it. Now, he wrote what he saw in a vision. And it was all in symbol. And here is some of the vision that he wrote in the 17th chapter. So he, the angel that was revealing these things to him in the vision, carried me away in the spirit, or in vision, into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast. Now, that's a peculiar kind of an animal. A scarlet-colored beast. And here's a woman riding this beast. And the beast is full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, that certainly is a very peculiar type of a beast. But dropping down, I'll come back to some of this later, but I want to drop down now to verse 12. There were ten horns on this beast. It had seven heads and ten horns. And in verse 12, And the ten horns which thou sowest are ten kings, kings or kingdoms, which have received no kingdom as yet, that is, at the time of the vision. Now, it's not the time that the vision was revealed to the Apostle John, but the time that the vision is taking place. And the vision was, was for the far future. In other words, it's for our day now. The ten horns which thou sowest are ten kings or kingdoms, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast, with this beast. They have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Then uh, they shall make war with the Lamb. Now here the Lamb is a symbol for Christ. Christ at his second coming. Now notice that they're going to make war with Christ. And the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. Christ has never been Lord of lords and King of kings. He will be the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings at the time of His second coming. And Christ's second coming is not far away now. It's within the lifetime of most of us living now. I hope I may live that long even myself. He is, will be Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. That is speaking there actually, of the church. Now, that's a peculiar kind of a beast. But what do they mean by beast? And what is it a symbol of? The book of Revelation is speaking in symbols. And here it speaks of a rather weird beast. Well, that refers us immediately back to the 13th chapter of Revelation. So we have to go back there to learn a little more about this beast and what it is. Now, back then to the 13th chapter... And uh, in verse 1 of the 13th chapter, And I stood upon the sand of the sea. 
Now, John is speaking of what he seemed to be in, in the vision. He seemed to be standing on the seashore in his vision, and he was speaking, uh, really, of the Mediterranean Sea. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, this seems to be referring to the same or certainly a similar beast to that in the 17th chapter. And upon his horns, ten crowns. Now, the crowns were not on the heads. The crowns are on the horns. And there were ten horns coming out of the seven heads of this beast. And upon the heads, the names of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. Now, that becomes more weird than ever. It was like a leopard. It wasn't a leopard, but it had the characteristics of a leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. He had the feet of a bear, the body of a leopard, and his mouth was as the mouth of a lion. You see, he wasn't like a lion. He wasn't like a bear. But he had the feet of a bear, he had the body of a leopard, and the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now, you have to turn over to the twelfth chapter to find out who, what the dragon represents. That is another symbol that represents something. And there it will tell you the dragon is that old serpent called Satan the devil. Satan the devil gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now, what do these things symbolize? Just what do they mean? Well, now we have to go back still further to understand, because the Bible interprets its own symbols. And so Daniel interprets these symbols. In the seventh chapter of Daniel, we begin to find a lot more about it. So we turn immediately next back to the 7th chapter of Daniel, and that will describe this beast of the 13th chapter. So back in the 7th chapter of Daniel, beginning with the first verse, In the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, Daniel, had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. He was asleep in bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. Again, this is speaking of the Mediterranean Sea. And the Mediterranean Sea is very stormy in the late fall and the early winter. Very, very stormy. And four great beasts came up out of the sea. Now, he doesn't see one beast. He sees four different beasts, you will notice, coming up out of the sea, diverse one from another. Each one was different from the other. Now, the first was like a lion, and I behold another beast, a second like a bear. That's in verse 5. Then we skip to verse 6. And after this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard. Now, it's beginning to resemble what we saw in the 13th chapter. The first was like a lion, the second like a bear, the third was like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and this beast had also four heads, and dominion was given unto it. Now, what could this beast be? It had four heads. Well, the lion had one head, and the bear had a head, but the leopard had four heads. So now we have six heads so far, and dominion was given unto it. And that sounds like government. Well, let's go further and see. And after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, signified by iron stronger than the other, and it devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all of the others, different from the others, 
Now, we read that the uh, one beast had different characteristics in the 13th chapter. But we see the same things here. We see the uh, lion and uh, the bear, the leopard, and now we see a fourth beast. And it had ten horns. Now, here are ten horns on the fourth beast. Now, the other beast didn't seem to have any horns. So we see that the ten horns were on the fourth beast. And I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his heads were as pillar wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire, and so on. Now next we come down, just skip down to the 17th verse. These great beasts, or wild animals, which are four, are... Now here we begin to see what they represent. What do the beasts of symbols, what do they represent? The 13th chapter didn't tell us. The 17th chapter of Revelation didn't tell us. But here in Daniel, it does tell us. They are four kings or kingdoms. Are four kings, and it's, as we'll see later, synonymous with kingdoms, which shall arise out of the earth. They arise out of the earth. The kingdoms, although he saw the animals arise out of the sea. But it says here, the saints, in verse 18, the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and forever, and so on. That was verse 18. Now, verse 23, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be not a fourth king, but a fourth kingdom. The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, a kingdom or government, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, as these beasts were diverse or different, that is, one from the other, and shall devour the whole earth and tread it down, and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of the uh, kingdom, out of the fourth beast, are ten kings, or other kingdoms, that shall arise. And another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first and shall subdue three kings. I haven't time to explain that right here, but that other beast has been explained. I skipped those verses here as another little horn among them, and which is the woman riding on the beast in the 17th chapter of Revelation, when you put them all together. Now, in verse 27, it speaks about down coming to the end time in verse 26. And the kingdom and the dominion and uh, the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven is not in heaven, it was on the earth. And the kingdom shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, will take over the government that these governments had been ruling on the earth. The saints will take them over, and all dominions shall serve and obey him, which is referring to Christ at his second coming, and the saints will be ruling under him, as you will read in the second and third chapters of Revelation. If we overcome, we will sit with him on his throne. If we are overcomers, we will be given power over the nations and rule them with a rod of iron, as you read in other places in the book of Revelation. Now then, we know something about that these are kings and kingdoms and governments. But what kings? What governments are them? We still don't know. It doesn't reveal it here. We have to go back still further now, back into the second chapter of Daniel. We go all the way back into the second chapter of Daniel now. And Daniel was called on to reveal a dream to the then reigning king Nebuchadnezzar. Now, there had been many ancient city-states. Then they became some ancient nations. The city-states, just cities that were governments in themselves, finally became whole nations, of which was Egypt, ancient Egypt, and 
and there was ancient uh, Greece and uh, uh, other nations of that sort. But the first world empire growing into a group of nations as an empire was formed by this Nebuchadnezzar along about 604 B.C. And uh, he was ruling well, up until about 580 B.C. And this Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the first world empire, had a dream. And Daniel, the prophet Daniel, one of the Jewish lads in the captivity who had been taken captive when Nebuchadnezzar and his army had overcome the kingdom of Judah in Jerusalem and conquered them and brought them as slaves into Babylon. And Daniel was a very brilliant young Jewish lad who was giving an important part in the government. And they learned that somehow God revealed dreams and things to him. And so he was brought in to this king Nebuchadnezzar who had a great dream. He had called the fortune tellers and all those people in the kingdom in to tell him the dream. Of course, they couldn't tell him what he dreamed. And he claimed he had forgotten, and he was just testing them. But Daniel said there was a God in heaven that would reveal it to him. And so he prayed to God for the revelation of the dream that this king had had. Now I come to this second chapter and verse 28 in Daniel, where Daniel said before this king Nebuchadnezzar, But there is a God in heaven who revealeth secrets, and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Getting down to our time now, the last days. You need that book that I mentioned a while ago. Are we in the last days right now? Because here is a prophecy about our time now, in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed were these. Now he went on to describe it. I will just say that he saw an image that was so great it was so great, it was terrifying. It was so large and so great. And it had a great head of fine gold. It had a breast and arms of silver, a belly and thigh of brass. And it had legs of iron, strong, of iron. And feet and toes, part of iron and part of miry clay, especially the ten toes on the feet. And the king had seen such a vision, but he didn't understand what it was, and Daniel came to tell him. So now we drop down to the 37th verse. Thou, O king, Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom. He was a king of kings, in other words, a number of nations. There were other nations under him. It was an empire, not just a single nation. And he said, The God of heaven have given you a kingdom and power and strength and glory. Then he continues, Thou art this head of gold. Now we begin to understand the meaning of these symbols. And after thee shall arise another kingdom, or another world empire, inferior to thee, just as silver is inferior to gold, but silver is a little stronger than gold, and militarily it was going to be stronger, but uh, spiritually or morally it was inferior. And another third kingdom of brass, again, still inferior morally or spiritually, but stronger materially and in military power, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Now, we know that's not some magic man coming to bear rule over the earth. This is the ancient kingdom of the Greco-Macedonian Empire. And a fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. Now, we know what that was. That was the Roman Empire. There is no doubt about what that was. And that was in verse 40. Now, we come to verse 44. And in the days of these kings, which was speaking of the feet and the toes and the ten toes, at the bottom of the two legs, of course, the two feet and the ten toes, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, 
and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And that, my friends, is the kingdom of God. And speaking of Christ coming to set up and to rule the kingdom of God. And so here we have it all the way through. So you can see that Daniel saw it in four wild animals. The first was like a lion. That was equivalent to the head of Nebuchadnezzar's image. And the second was the uh, bear with the strong feet. And that was equivalent to the uh, next kingdom that followed, the Persian Empire. And uh, the third beast that Daniel saw in the seventh chapter was like a leopard, swift and fight like cat-like, very rapid and fast. It was like a leopard, and it had four heads. That was the Greco-Macedonian Empire. Now, Philip of Macedon died when he was just going to start a war, and his son Alexander, who became known as Alexander the Great, took it up. And he had the swiftest army that the world had ever known, like a leopard. He came down and conquered the whole world. He died in a drunken debauch. And he said he died in despair because there were no more worlds to conquer. He'd conquered all the world, and he knew in those days the whole world centered around the eastern Mediterranean, as far as they knew in those days. And in his stead came up four divisions, each headed by one of his four generals of his army. And that represented the four heads of Daniel's third beast, like a leopard. And then the fourth beast that Daniel had, strong like iron, was the same as the Roman Empire, which followed that with the strength of iron and ruling the whole world at that time. Ruling on the west, ruling all of the east, on both sides of the Mediterranean Ocean, as a matter of fact, and as far east as India. And so now we begin to get a little bit of a definition of just who these wild animals represent, what they represent, and they are representing political governments in this world. I wonder if you know that the gospel of Jesus Christ was suppressed within 21 or 22 years after he preached it. It had been suppressed and was not preached in the world until now. And Jesus Christ himself in the 24th chapter of Matthew was asked for a sign of his second coming as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he said, this gospel of the kingdom, the government of God, it's the family of God, the born-again family of God, not born again into human beings, but born again into divine beings. You see, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit, said Jesus Christ, is spirit. And we are not spirit. And nobody who is flesh and blood is born again or has been born again. But we have a lot of people, even a few million of them, claiming to be born again now. And they are simply deceived. That is not scriptural. It's not according to the Word of God. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And the gospel that Jesus proclaimed was the kingdom of God about a government. And we... Christians and the church is merely the kingdom of God being trained and having the Holy Spirit of God and learning the way of life of God, of God's way of life, to be changed from mortal to immortal, from human to divine, and to rule over all nations under Christ when he comes in his second coming to rule. That, my friends, is the gospel of Jesus Christ which has not been proclaimed for 1950 years and is being proclaimed this minute in your ears and you're listening to it and it's time that we begin to heed it now I want to go on a little further in this and in a little more detail in the book of Revelation we'll put that off till later but meantime that mysterious book of Revelation 
It is unveiled now so you can understand it. And here I have a book that I'd like to offer to you, the book of Revelation unveiled at last. I've read to you in previous programs how in Daniel, the twelfth chapter, the prophecy that was given to Daniel, which runs right along with the book of Revelation, was closed and sealed until the time of the end, when many would run rapidly to and fro, like we do on automobiles and airplanes and every way of speed today, and knowledge would be increased. Oh, what a time of increase of knowledge. But here the book of Revelation is open to our understanding at last, and you can understand it, and it tells of the events that are going to open up the way. Now, I'm going to show you later that this beast of the 17th chapter of Revelation is a coming United States of Europe that is being formed right now. And that will bring on the Great Tribulation and that will end in the second coming of Christ, the end of this present civilization of this world and the beginning of the wonderful world tomorrow. You need this booklet on Revelation. You need that booklet that I mentioned. You need this book of the United States and Britain of prophecy. Where is the United States and Britain mentioned in Bible prophecy? And specifically, what's going to happen to us in this great tribulation that's pending right now in the next few years? The only way you can know what is going to happen to us, prophecy has been closed. It's unlocked in this book, The United States and Prophecy. And I'd like to send you your subscription to the Plain Truth magazine. I've mentioned that time and again. There is no cost. There's no subscription price to the Plain Truth. There's no charge for these booklets. We want to give. We're not out to get. There'll be no follow-up and request for money. I'd like to give it to you, and all you do is send your request for those booklets to me, Herbert W. Armstrong, Pasadena, California. That's all the address you need. Herbert W. Armstrong, Pasadena, California, 91123. So until next time, Herbert W. Armstrong, goodbye, friends. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.